part two. Oh, my alarm went off, sorry about that. I don't know if you guys heard that or not, but either way. Um, so, we have this probability density function, okay, that we're working with. Um, I should need to go back, but we'll have two videos, that's fine. One right after the other. Uh, so what we were doing, remember, is we were calculating uh, the probability uh, for for this all the way across we want to figure out that probability by figuring out the area under the curve We know the area under this curve because these are all the allowed values is one so we know that this range the area uh, Probability is one which is also corresponds to the area area is length and of course times width for a rectangle So my length um, is going to be from my probability value whatever it is we'll call that p at x we don't know what it is uh, all the way down to zero well that this length is p at x minus zero to figure out what this length is or we just call p at x because p at x minus zero is just p at x so that's my length my width is from here to here that we can figure out it's from 500 to 20 and most people could probably do that in their head p at x uh, and then 480 not too crazy we of course know that equals one all the way along so if we want to figure out what p at x is, we just isolate. Now it is dependent on the units that we use. Okay, so if we use grams for this unit, we go from 500 to 20, then this value is in grams. Everything else should be in grams associated with it. But the probability, if we broke it into milligrams or something, obviously the units would change and the probability of an individual outcome would be really small. And here it's already pretty small. It's one over 480. Okay, so once I have that particular value, and I've got it nicely worked out with colors and all sorts of stuff in your notes, so have a look at that. Okay, I can do a final labeling of a proper graph and then actually use it for calculations. And that's really the reason why we're doing this. So this is going to be 1 out of 480. You can figure it out as a number, but it's going to be a pretty small decimal. So I just put 1 over 480. I draw my line, hopefully as straight as I can. Obviously not very good. Look at that. Okay, from 20 to 500. And it's from this figure that goes from here to here. 20, it's from this figure that it makes, us really, makes it really, really useful for us to now start doing some calculations for two reasons. One, we know uh, all of the values for lengths and widths. Okay, If we want to figure out the probability of a range, all we have to do is figure out what that area is. And of course, it's going to be another box, another rectangle. So we're just going to be figuring out lengths and widths. So let's look at a couple of examples of that. What is the probability that a person would purchase between... Oops. <laughs> This is from an old note. I changed it to uh, imperial units. Sorry, from imperial units, ounces, to uh, metric units. I guess I just didn't quite finish my note. So in our worked examples, we'll go from 100 grams and 400 grams. So what's the probability that a person would purchase between 100 grams and 400 grams? I guess what we consider to be a, a fair bit of Smarties, okay? So here we want to know the probability that it's going to be between 100 and 400. Okay, what's the probability between there? And remember, it's going to be the area, but it's not going to be the area between 20 and 500. It's going to be the area in here. Okay, so 400 is about here. I'm just making it up because it's more about widths and stuff like that. And this is, oops, this is going to be 100. I want to make it at least somewhat appropriate uh, in size. And so I want to figure out what this area is right here. Okay, so my area again is going to be my length times my width. It's just a little rectangle. There's also sort of a generic formula you can use, but I'll get to that in a second. Okay, uh, my length, remember, was from here to here. So that's going to be uh, 1 over 480, right? One, and four, 1 over 480 minus 0, okay, is that one. And then my width, remember, goes from here to here in there. Okay, and that's going to be, well, basically 400 minus 100. So for a uniform distribution, it's just the probability multiplied by the range, okay? And this probability has to correspond to the units that I use here. If I put this in milligrams, this probability should be in milligrams as well, uh, if you want to do that accurately. And so then we go, okay, so the probability that um, x is going to be between 100 and 400 is, uh, that's going to be 300, uh, 400 minus 100, 300, right? Multiply by 1, so that's just 300, all over 480. Or that totals down to 5 of 8, or 0 0.625. Terminating decimals, so that's good. You can just leave it at that as if you want to. Or 6250. Again, we should get used to that four decimal place uh, standard that we use. Okay? 
Um, another worked example, nothing too crazy. What is the probability that a person chose to buy at least, okay, okay you got to change these numbers, 400 grams of candy? So if it's at least 400 grams of candy, that means it's going to be 400 grams or more. But of course, the maximum is 500. So this is the probability that X is going to be greater than or equal to 400 grams. Again, that's an area. And that area is going to be my length times my width. And I'll draw it, sketch it on my graph over here from 400 to 500. This is the sort of area that I'm doing. I'm just going to go the other way so the hatchings can outline the second question. So this would be a B and this would be C. Okay, uh, between 400 and 500, and of course, we've got a length of 1 over 480, we've got a width of uh, that range. So 1 over 480 is my length, my width is going to be 500 minus 400. It's almost ridiculous that we're even doing this calculation, 500 minus 400. But anyway, we say the probability that x is going to be greater than or equal to 400 grams, that's at least, right? It means greater than or equal to, uh, it's going to be 100 over 480 or 5 of 12, um, or I guess 0 0.4167 for those of us who don't want to reduce fractions. Four decimal places, perfectly fine and an acceptable uh, value to reach. So that's basically how to do uniform distributions calculations. And it's your first peak at areas under the curve. Very nice, easy, simple area to do, even if it was sort of a uh, a diagonal or a, a function with a, a linear function with a slope, we could probably do it by figuring out a, a rectangle as well as a triangle. Those of you guys again are physicists, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so that, that's a worked example there for you. Uh, consult your notes if you want a nice, beautiful version of it. Okay, because uh, that's not so pretty. Uh, and now we have, for the last part of our notes, we have sort of other common distributions. So we know a little bit about it, and then we just go from there. And really what we're going to focus on is the normal distribution for the rest of this unit. Because it's so common, and that's the key. So you can read this little thing about it, but we find the normal distribution everywhere. Okay, in fact, the, the binomial distribution for a large enough sample size it looks exactly like this, even though it's discrete. So if you look at the patterns of the bars, it looks exactly like it. Except the binomial is for discrete variables, and this is for continuous variables, but it looks exactly the same. So this jumps up everywhere and everywhere. For those of you guys who've done biology and you remember doing evolution in grade 11, you saw these curves. And so if you saw like convergent evolution or divergent evolution, then you saw this function sort of change shape like that, if it was divergent. And if, uh, if it was convergent evolution, uh, then we saw sort of a slicing off of here and here and a reforming of the normal curve. Uh, this is a, a distribution of, 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 of particular characteristics in a population that are determined by multiple genes generally tend to form this. So this is really quite common. And as a result of it, it's something that we should be used to. So the normal distribution has a lot of characteristics to it. I'm going to briefly touch on a few here, but that's about it. First of all, it's got one bump, one highest frequency, which means it's got one mode or unimodal. Uh, what's also interesting is the mean for this population is equal to the mode, and it's nice and symmetrical. If you cut it in half, it's the same thing on the left that it is in the right. If I made this a mirror, it would look the same on both sides. That's sort of an idea. Kind of like roughly the human face. Okay, we have that uh, meridontal symmetry that exists, where if we go straight down our bodies, at least externally, we look pretty much the same left side and right side. Anyway, that's the normal distribution, so that's a type of distribution. Also, what we learn is something called skew from that distribution. So when we look at other distributions, okay, other types of distributions, one example would be a skew. So we take this normal distribution, and what happens is if we make the left-hand side or the right-hand side any bigger than, the, than each other, okay, so if the left-hand side's bigger than the right or the right-hand side's bigger than the left, then we get what's called a skew. And that's a really important idea, at least to be familiar with when you head into university, because you're going to measure skew, and there's adjustments you can make to skew, okay? So there's a negative skew and a positive skew, okay? Again, it centers on this feature of the mean, relationship of the mean with the mode, okay? My mode here is the bump. The top of the bump is right here. But if you notice, the left-hand side is a little bit bigger than the right-hand side, which means there's more material on the left and more frequency on the left than there is on the right, which means if I have a larger amount or frequency of individuals on this side compared to this side, then my mean is going to get pulled downwards by these smaller values. 
If I get pulled downwards by these smaller values, then what happens is my mean separates from my mode, and you'll see it slide downwards. That's the green value that we're looking at here relative to the pink where the mode is. And so we call that a negative skew because it's pulled the centrality of the actual function, the density of the function a bit to the left, even though the mode is where it is. Okay, so we call that a negative skew. An example that I used here, uh, negatively skewed continuous distribution of probability showing the distribution of the number of pieces of pizza eaten by students at one sitting. Okay, a lot of students will eat one or two pieces. Okay, uh, and there'll be more people who eat one or two pieces just because they're not that hungry. And then most people will eat, you know, two or three pieces, whatever they normally would eat, depending, of course, on the size. And then some people will eat more. Okay, this could be at a party with a, a nice distribution of people of all ages where you have little kids who can only eat a little bit and you have adults and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, a positive skew is just the same thing as a negative skew, it just goes in the other direction. So we've got our mode, which is sitting right there, and then we've got our mean, which is pulled upwards, okay, or positively moved upwards or translated upwards uh, because there's more values above the mode than there is below the mode. So the mean and the mode separate from each other again. Okay, this is a positively skewed distribution We're showing the probability of the number of pieces of pizza eaten by students in one sitting. Uh, but this could be for a different population. Maybe this is all for, I don't know, people who have big appetites, football players or, I don't know, pubescent boys who are ridiculously hungry. Okay, there's still going to be some people who have a small amount of pieces, but there's going to be a lot of people who are eating a lot of pieces of pizza. Okay, and as a result, then there you go. Okay, so it sort of depends. Another couple of examples of distributions that we see, something called a bimodal distribution, which is actually very often seen uh, in what are called sexually dimorphic populations or in populations that actually tend to have sort of two groupings to them. <clears throat> I use sexual dimorphism as an example because a lot of animals uh, tend, or plants tend to have very different forms for the male and female. You know, you can think of maybe, for example, a, a gorilla. The male gorilla is huge, massive creature. And the female gorilla is a little bit more gracile and a little bit less burly and muscular. Okay, so you can think of that. A peacock is a very good example. A peacock with the huge tail feathers. Okay, and then you have a peahen, which has tail feathers that look like they're just like normal feathers. Okay, uh, so, so that being the case, then you will see a, a, a separation between the two and you will see two groups. And this happens a lot in populations, showing two groups, okay, distinct groups, especially in stratified populations. And it's bimodal because there's two bumps, simple. And the bumps don't have to be the same size. Um, an exponential distribution is also somewhat common where something sort of decreases in probability as time has gone by or increases in probability as time has gone by uh, in, in certain situations. Uh, and so as a result, it's something that we also should know a little bit more about. Okay, you don't have a lot of homework, but you do have a worked example and a couple of examples of uh, situations that would match these. Uh, so have a peek and see if you can understand them a little bit better. Definitely read the textbook. Uh, they've got a good overview of it as well.